Good morning. Good morning. My name is Alex Wolf. I'm the college minister uh, here at PCBC. Uh, I've actually been serving on the staff at Park Cities for just about three and a half years now. Uh, and do me a favor real fast. If you're in the college ministry, could you stand up real quick? Uh, this is for any college students who are in the room. Oh, thank you. Give them a hand. Thank you. Uh, any college students who are in the room, uh, we're pretty good Baptists. We sit in the same spot every week. Uh, so if, if you didn't know we had a college ministry, we're right here. Come say hi to us. Come join us for Connect Group. Uh, a little bit about me. My name, uh, well, obviously my name is Alex. I've said that. Uh, I'm from Iowa. My wife is from Iowa. We just had uh, our first child. His name is Lachlan Wolf. He is just over four months old. Uh, he's, he's adorable. He's crazy, and we kind of think he has a secret plot to kill us, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that one plays out. We're not sure yet. Um, but my wife, her name is Lindsay. We've been married for just over seven years. Uh, my wife is incredible. She, uh, she loves on our college students well. She's there at every ministry event. Uh, she works full-time at the seminar at DTS, where I study. Uh, and on top of that, she serves our family with a lot of care, a lot of care. I couldn't do anything without her, so I'm so thankful for her. Uh, but let me tell you something about my wife that just drives me absolutely crazy. Uh, my wife, I love her to death, but she is the worst to watch movies with. Uh, she loves spoilers. Maybe some of you are in here and you like spoilers too. Uh, she can't stand not knowing what happens in the movie. She has to know who wins, how they win, who dies, why they die, before she will ever consider watching the great battle scenes with me, you know, the good action movies. And it drives me crazy. So I have to tell her who wins. And if, she, if I don't know who wins, she'll Google it. And then we both end up knowing who wins before the movie even starts. Well, maybe you're here today and like my wife with movies, you're anticipating the climax of your story. And it's too much for you not knowing how it ends. Maybe you feel like your story has taken a wrong turn. And you're riddled with fear and anxiety, wondering, am, am I in the right job? Did I marry the right person? Did I choose the right friends? Am I going to the right church? And you think, hey, maybe my story has been derailed somehow. Maybe the author has just written me out of the story. I think sometimes we just need to know that there's a happy ending. We need to know that all ends well before we can face those climactic moments. And maybe right now you're just not so sure. Maybe you're not so sure your story ends with victory. Uh, so today the title of my sermon is called Spoiler Alert uh, because my job today is to spoil the end of the story for you so that you can face those climactic moments, that suspense with confidence and with hope, knowing that your story is heading towards victory. So we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 17 through 20 today. It's a large portion of scripture. We probably won't be able to fit it all on the screen. So if you have your Bibles, those will come in handy. You want to start flipping over there now. And we're going to be looking at the climax of the story of the Bible. And if you haven't been with us, if you're new here or, or you just haven't been paying attention, uh, we are going through the year of the Bible right now. And we're looking at how our lives intersect with God's story how our stories intersect with his story. And right now we're in the final series of that uh, year of the Bible entitled Revelation, When Fairy Tales Come True. And I think that's fitting because in a world with comic books and action movies, and uh, I think we can get caught, caught reading our Bibles in the same light. As another action thriller that has a lot of good principles for my life, but otherwise is pretty, pretty much detached from me. Well, I want to suggest today that the opposite is true, that the story of the Bible is not a story read or meant to be read and just enjoyed. It's a story meant to be read and adopted. It's your story and it's my story and it's a true story. And my job today is to tell you that it's not over yet. You're still in it. The story is still going and I'm trying to take the suspense out of it for us so that we can face the climactic moment knowing that your story is heading towards a grand victory. Uh, so before we even get into the main part of the sermon, I'm just going to go ahead and spoil the story for you. I'm going to read what I think is the climactic moment in the book of Revelation in chapter 19, and I'm going to be looking at verses 6 through 9. And John says in Revelation, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, 
Like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So if you're hearing this the first time, you're looking at me, you're saying, so Alex, you, you think that the grand climax of the Bible is a wedding. I would say, absolutely I do. The entire story of the Bible is about a wedding. It's about one marriage between one man and one woman becoming one flesh. The story of the Bible starts with Genesis 2.24. God says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, Paul says that wasn't about human marriage. That was about Christ and the church. See, Christ will leave the Father, and he will join to his bride, the church, and the two will become one flesh, God with us. That's the story of the Bible. But unfortunately, the God, God's people, who he was supposed to become one flesh with, didn't really obey him. They weren't always faithful. And so the rest of the story of the Bible is God creating for himself and making pure for himself a bride. And we're left in suspense wondering, will she ever make it to the wedding? And we're watching and she's unfaithful time after time after time and we're wondering, will she ever make it? Will she ever be ready? And we just found out she makes it to the wedding. And she's joined with the bride. We're about to find out she lives happily ever after with the groom. And so... Today, as we look at Revelation 17 through 20, we're going to see Revelation's guide to wedding planning. Now, I understand that this is a future version of the bride, the church, that are going to experience these actual things in the future. But all of the bride of Christ throughout all generations are called to make ourselves ready for the great wedding feast of the Lord, because we have no idea when the Lord is going to return. We have no idea when the groom is coming back. And so we're going to learn a little something from our future brothers and sisters about how to prepare ourselves for that great moment in the story. Uh, so what we're going to learn from them first, how to prepare ourselves for the wedding is, first thing we got to do is delete your ex's number. Delete your ex's number. Uh, now, why in the world would I say that? Well, first, because they haven't changed. <laughs> they haven't cha anybody in this room who's ever tried to get back with an ex uh, has probably muttered or uttered to themselves, either in their hearts or out loud, that uh, maybe they've changed. Maybe it'll be different this time. We're about to see that that is definitely not the case. She did not change, and she is the exact same as she's always been. Look at Revelation 17, verses 1 through 5. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute, or the harlot who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and of the impurities of her sexual immorality. immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abomination. So we see this harlot, she's riding in on the beast. We talked about the beast last week. Uh, Satan has appointed her, and she is exactly like Satan. We, we see she embodies two things. She embodies this instant gratification, this sexual pleasure, and she embodies greed. This is what she's like. She's enticing the kings to come into her and to have pleasure with her, and she's enticing the merchants of the world with her jewels and her gold and her silver and her pearls and say, come, partake, partake. And she embodies this idea that is selfish ambition. And if we think uh, back to where we are now, this is nothing new. See, the, Satan is throwing at us today the same flaming darts, the same flaming arrows that he will throw at them then. 
Even though the harlot is not here today, the ideology and the theology that she represents is alive and well today. This selfish ambition, if we even think further back, it's the same fiery darts that Satan's been throwing at humanity since the beginning of the story. If you think with me to Adam and Eve, they had a choice, represent God according to his word and his desires or reject God and do it your own way. Selfish ambition, we know the choice they made. Israel was presented with a similar choice. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Or go after the gods and the nations and be adulterous. And we know the choice that they made. And see, Solomon understood this choice when he wrote the book Proverbs and he addresses his son. And he says, son, you have two choices. You could choose the wife, wife of your youth, which is the covenant of God. Or you can choose the adulterous woman which is instant gratification, greed, selfish ambition. One leads to life, one leads to death. Which one are you going to choose? Pick wisely, by the way, because it is Proverbs. Uh, And the same thing is true today. The theology didn't stop there. It kept going, and we see in Revelation they're dealing with the same thing. It's just manifested in a nation, Babylon, the harlot. So we see it today. We have to be aware of this theology. We have to be in the words so that we can discern this theology from our own. So delete her number because she hasn't changed and delete her number because the idea that I can still be friends with my ex doesn't work, at least in this case. Uh, Read Revelation 17, verse six with me. 17, verse six, it says, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. You see, somebody in the relationship always wants more than they're letting on. And in this case, the harlot's enticing the bride, is enticing the saints of Jesus, saying, come over here. But she has no intention of sharing. She wants all of them. She says, come over here, join me, and then she's going to kill him. She wants way more than she's initially letting on. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. And we know, folks, that we cannot serve two masters. Or in this case, we cannot serve two spouses. Uh, The harlot wants nothing more than to have you just join her side. And the bride wants you to join her side. We have to choose. And in not choosing, James, the apostle in his book, James, (laughs) uh, calls this double-mindedness. And it's a real problem. See, people in James' church were professing faith in Jesus, saying, yeah, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus, but I continue in my salvation by going back to law keeping. So I'll start by faith and I'll continue on by law keeping. And they were looking at themselves and and some of them were rich and they were saying, see, I'm rich because God is blessing me because I'm doing good things for God. In other words, God takes bribes. And it was manifesting itself with the poor and they they were looking at the poor in the church, these are believers, and saying, you're poor because you're not keeping the law. And this was double-minded. So when the poor man would come into the church, the rich man would say, sit at my feet. You're not worthy to sit next to me. Guys, this was happening in the church. It's called double-mindedness, and James calls it satanic. He calls it satanic, and it is satanic. If you think to the book of Job, you know the book of Job. You know, Satan wanders into God's presence. God says something along the lines of, hey, Satan, what have you been up to? I'm paraphrasing, of course. Uh, Satan says... You know, just roaming the earth, wrecking the joint, you know, same old. God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? There's none righteous like him in all of the world. Job's like, yeah, I've seen him. He's got a lot of good stuff. Stop giving him good stuff and he'll stop worshiping you. He'll curse you to your face. And we know the story. Job loses all of his stuff and he doesn't curse God. He worships God. He blesses God. You know, and then... Job's friends come into the scene. They say, Job, what'd you do, man? Job's like, I don't know. I don't think I did anything. Well, you must have done something to deserve this kind of fate. You know, if you repent and you start doing good stuff for God, he'll probably give you your stuff back. See, you got to bribe God and he'll, and he'll give you what you want in return. Now, we think about it this way. We, we, we might have heard it today like this, because this theology is rampant in the church today. 
You might have heard it said, uh, God helps those who help themselves. Some of you might even think that's in the Bible. I don't know. Uh, those words aren't in the Bible, but the theology is, and it's Satan's theology. God helps those. Is that really what it is? How about if you're sick, you must have done something wrong to deserve this kind of fate. Repent. I heard this over and over and over again as my mom died from cancer over seven years. What did she do wrong? What did she do wrong? Repent, repent. God will heal you. How about more personally, most of us pray this way, don't we? We, we say, hey, I, it's only been a couple of days since I looked at that thing on the internet. I, I really can't pray fully right now. I got to kind of just sit there and, re, and just repent in my mind for, you know, two weeks. I got to wait till I go two weeks without looking at porn on the internet before I can really pick back up my relationship with God. Because God's got to like me first. Guys, this theology is satanic and it's double-minded and we're called to leave it behind. So break up with her because she hasn't changed. And two, because uh, she, oh, what did I say? Uh, because you can't be friends with your ex. And also because listening to her voice will only lead to disappointment. Look at 18 verses 1 through 5. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory, and he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast, for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. And then I heard a voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Folks, it's a trap. She says something along the lines of, hey, you only live once, YOLO, I'd have heard. You only live once. You have one shot at this thing. You better just make yourself happy. Pursue happiness. Pursue pleasure. Because once you die, that's the end of it. You've got no other shot at this thing. So get what you can out of it now. And she says, you will not regret it. But we know she cannot deliver. If we continue reading in, in chapter 18, we're not going to do, but I'll summarize it for you. It's the nations of the world, it's the kings of the earth, and the merchants, and they're all crying and they're devastated because the harlot is dead. There's nobody to commit immorality with, and all the stuff they got from her, the gold and the precious jewels, are all of a sudden worth nothing. There's no vindication in her. And by vindication, if you've never heard that word, it means uh, the proof that you made the right choice. Vindication is the proof that you made the right choice. And in her, there is no vindication. There's only death. She says you'll be happy, but you end up dead. And so the exhortation, God says, is come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. Delete her number. If you're here today and you found yourself standing in the middle between the bride and the harlot, and you've never put yourself aligned with the bride, you've never accepted Jesus, you never put your trust in him, you never put the hope in him, confessing that he is Jesus, I want to talk to you after this right through those doors. Because God's word for you is come out of her. You don't need to be over there. You don't need to go towards death. You can come over here and go towards life. And if you're here today and you're already part of the bride and you've confessed Jesus as Lord and you trust in him for salvation, and you're still hanging out with the harlot, God's word for you is come out of her, my people. What are you doing over there? There's nothing over there. There's only death and you've already got eternal life. So what are you doing? There's nothing for you there. Don't be dual-minded. Stay the course. Join yourself back to the bride. Cling to Christ. Cling to Christ. So we're gonna delete her number and then we're gonna prepare ourselves for the wedding. And turning our back to the harlot, we're going to prepare ourselves for the wedding. And the first way we do this is by joining ourselves to the bride. Look at 19, chapter 19, verse 6. We're going to jump ahead here. Chapter 19, verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, 
like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. See, we see here this great multitude. This is the multitude that becomes the bride. She becomes the bride. This isn't just you. We're not called to just prepare ourselves for the wedding, do a bunch of good things and get in God's good standing so that we'll be prepared for that final day. We're called to prepare one another for the wedding. The bride is the church. The bride is not us. It is all of us together. And we are called to make ourselves ready together, to build one another up in love, to prepare ourselves for that great day that's coming. And so if you're here today and you've been showing up, you might even be a member and you've not plugged into a connect group or you've not offered your service to the church, I'm telling you, you're only, you only have half of the equation. We're called to build one another up in love, to serve one another. We are the bride that are going to present ourselves pure together on that wedding day. We all have the same finish line. We need to do it together. So after we've joined ourselves to the bride, we stay focused on the groom. We stay focused on the groom. Look at verse 7, 19 verse 7. It says, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. I want you to see, let us rejoice and give him the glory. See, these are people who, um, they're not focused on the harlot. They're focused on the groom. They're watching him come. They've turned their back to greed and instant gratification, turned their back on selfish ambition, and here they are, they're sacrificing for the testimony of the Lord. So if she represents uh, selfish ambition, he represents sacrifice and love. And they're focusing on him, and they start to tangle on his character. We see that the harlot ends up killing some of them because they won't convert, because they won't join her. So she says, well, I'll just kill them then. And they've stayed faithful. They've turned their back on the pleasures of the world and they're staying faithful. So that's my encouragement. Stay faithful. Join yourself to the bride. Now stay faithful. And how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, judging by history, uh, it's not enough for us just to have negative consequences. We already said that joining yourself to the harlot will end up in death. But that doesn't always work. That That doesn't always motivate us. If that were true, then smokers would always stop smoking the second they find out that it'll probably lead to lung cancer. No, we are not motivated by negative consequences. Rather, we need a why. We need to have a why. My dad didn't quit smoking until us kids were born and we started taking notice. And I picked up a cigarette off the ground and lit it with my little, uh, you know, magnifying glass. And he, he saw me do it and he said, whoa, I need to be a better example for my kids. And he quit smoking when I was five years old and never looked back. It's because he had a why. And brides and grooms do this all the time. They order their tux, they order their dress, right? And then they go on a diet for six months that they wouldn't have otherwise done because they want to fit into the tux and the dress. All of a sudden, there's a why. And it motivates them. And church, our why is the wedding day. Our why is the wedding day, presenting ourselves pure and faithful to the groom, knowing that he alone has authority to judge, that he alone has hope for the world. So we're preparing ourselves, and our why is this great wedding day, and so we want to be pure. So my last point is get cleaned up. Get cleaned up. Revelation 19, 8 through 9. Let's read this together. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So we see here, the bride is presenting herself clean and pure to the groom. But we see that she doesn't do it to herself. She's given the garments that are clean and pure. Elsewhere in Ephesians, we're told that the bride doesn't purify herself. It's the groom that purifies her through the washing of the word. Of course, this is Christ in the church. Um, And uh, so we are not called to work harder and to get back into right standing with God so that he'll like you enough on the wedding day. No, this is step out of his way and let him purify you for the wedding day. 
This is don't go back to law keeping once you start by faith. You're clean. You start by faith. You go back to law keeping, you need to be clean. We need to stop striving for self righteousness and we need to trust in his imputed righteousness. That's what it means to present ourselves pure, to continually, day after day, failure after failure, trust in the fact that he's paid it with his blood. We just sang, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe, sin has left a crimson, crimson stain, he washed away his snow. We didn't do that. He did that. We need to get out of his way and let him clean us. We cannot make ourselves clean apart from Christ. And so we delete the X's number. We prepare ourselves for the wedding. And after that, what do we do? Well, we get to enjoy the marriage. We get to enjoy the marriage. Now, this is the grand moment The bride has resisted the harlot. She's made herself ready. And now we watch as the groom comes in and saves the bride and secures her future in his love. Let's read together. This is a big chunk. The rest of chapter 19, starting in verse 11. And we're going to go just a few verses into chapter 20. So read along with me. Then I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. This is our king, folks. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress on the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then John writes, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come! Gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse against his enemies. So they're opposing the king, they're opposing the groom, and the beast who was captured, verse 20, and with it, the false prophet who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Chapter 20, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit, a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the pit and he shut it and he sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a while. As here we see the king approaching in all of his glory. And just as he spoke into existence the whole world, so he speaks with the sword of his mouth and his enemies fall flat on his face. That's our groom. He's powerful. And he's coming in glory. And we get to watch. And we get to watch all the enemies, not of just him, but of us. The tempters, the harlot, the serpent, the dragon, who are saying, come join our side, they're going to be gone. And let's face it, the most... Stressful part of the Christian life is the fact that we're tempted all the time. But that's going away. And when that goes away, we get to enjoy the vindication of our choice. We get to enjoy the vindication of our choice. Rest in the fact that you made the right choice. And the proof is eternal life. It's eternal life. Read with me real fast last time. In chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, it says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. 
They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life till a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Folks, this is the part we get to cling to, to get us through the climactic moment. This is the grand victory. If you are in the bride, you cannot die, it says. Now, of course, we'll die the first time, but Paul is so convinced that that's insignificant that he calls it falling asleep. And he proves YOLO wrong. You know this phrase, you only live once? It's wrong because once you fall asleep, you raise back up. And guess what? The second life is much longer and much more pleasurable than the first life could have ever been had you joined yourself to the heart of it. YOLO is false. Imagine what we can do knowing that truth. That's a superpower, isn't it? Immortality, nothing can harm me. I'm heading straight towards eternal life, raised from the dead. If you're in the bride, you can't die. There's no need for fear. So knowing this, knowing that this life isn't the end and that eternal life is coming, what decisions might you make differently? Will you continue to let fear and anxiety rule your life? Or will you make your decisions in bravery, knowing that the victory is yours? There is no vindication for instant gratification and selfish ambition. Only temporary pleasure resulting in death. The motto of, this, of the serpent is uh, reward now, suffer later. There is only vindication in sacrifice and love. The motto of the groom is suffer now, reward later. So knowing this, we don't have to be anxious about all of our choices. We just have to worry about one choice, the harlot or the bride. And once you've joined yourself to the bride, you can rest knowing that the victory is yours. You can rest in your decisions. So maybe you were here today and you said, yeah, that was me. I, I wondered, did I marry the right person? <laughs> Am I in the right family? Do I have the right friends? Folks, we are called to love who we have. I want to tell you a story of a professor of mine in my undergrad. He, he was from India, and he let it slip one day in class that he had been in an arranged marriage for about 30 years. And we all gasped, you know, how, how uh, repressed are you? And he says, you Americans, you guys just marry who you love. He's like, we Indians, we love who we marry. And I think that's the point. He said, which one is more agape love? Which one is more the love of Christ? And I, that just really hit home for me. It doesn't matter how much, how, how pretty he thought his wife was or the other way around. It didn't matter how good they were to each other. It didn't matter if she hated his guts. He was called to love her and she was called to love him. And that's the same for us. You are called to love who you have, regardless of merit. And you can only do that because you know the end of the story. If the end of the story isn't happening, folks, don't love them. If you're not going to be raised from the dead, don't love them. Because you only have one life, and it's going to end in death. So live it up. But if the end of this story is true, if eternal life is true, if resurrection from the dead is true, then love her with everything you got Sacrifice, sacrifice your happiness because you know the end of the story is heading towards the eternal life of happiness. And maybe you're here today and just like marriage, you're thinking, am I in the right job? Am I in the right church? Still riddled with anxiety. Serve where you're at, folks. Serve where you're at. I was in London a few weeks ago and I met this man named Carl. And Carl is this incredible guy. He came to know the Lord. He worked in the finance district of London came to know the Lord about four and a half years ago, and he was so sharp, everyone was like, Carl, you need to become a minister. <laughs> and he said, I am. Uh, they didn't know that he'd been sharing the gospel for the you know, as soon as he accepted the gospel, he went and started sharing it with people in his workplace, regardless of what HR said. Now, he was sensitive. But he got three or four believers, and he said, I get to disciple them all day, every day. And you and the church get to disciple people for like two hours, two times a week. 
And he told me that these folks that he was discipling, three of them throughout his, he's been doing it for four and a half years now, so there's a lot of them, but three of them uh, were so excited about this thing, they turned down high-level promotions because they felt like they were making progress with the gospel on the floor they were working on. That spits in the face of selfish ambition. The world looks at that and says, that's so foolish, you just blew your chance for easy money and easy status. Why would you do that? He said, well, because we know the end of the story. We know all those things are going away. But we can sacrifice knowing that we will be vindicated. So if you chose the bride today, you will be vindicated. Your story is heading towards eternal life, resurrection from the dead. You can count on it. You can bank on it. So I've spoiled the suspense for you. You don't need to worry about how your story will end. So you can face your choices with confidence and with bravery, knowing that a grand victory awaits you at the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your story, that you were gracious enough to reveal your character to us through your grand story. And not that you were just gracious enough to reveal it, but you were able to include us in your story. And not just that, but you revealed the ending to us so graciously so that we could live our lives sacrificially for you with confidence and with hope. We could sacrifice like your son sacrificed because we know that an eternal weight of glory is waiting for us. We don't deserve. God, may we rest in the accomplished work of Jesus. May we approach our lives with bravery. May we encourage us this week as we walk into our marriages and our jobs, our churches, whatever it might be. Help us to love sacrificially and represent you well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.